coming to you tonight from the Stork Communication Plaza at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm Shannon Bradley. The Stork Tower was named for Thomas Stork. He's the rancher and newspaper publisher who first brought the university to this site on the Central Coast in the 1940s. UCSB became the third of what is now a 10-campus system of the University of California, where each day faculty, staff, and students pursue knowledge in the public interest, making California a state of minds. Santa Barbara is among the most popular of the UC campuses, in part because of its academic reputation, but also because of its vibrant student life, both on and off campus. One of the most active places we found was here at the base of Stork Tower. And it seems fitting that a tower named for a media man would house the campus radio station, KCSB, and its newspaper, The Daily Nexus. And it is there that we begin tonight. Our first stop was to see Jerry Roberts, the veteran California journalist who came to UCSB about a year ago as the publications director. Well, I had been in the daily newspaper business for a long time, for about 30 years, and uh, um, there had been a lot of changes that had been going on in the business, and I just felt it was a really good time for a change and for me to begin to work with student journalists. Um, in a way that I could um, both learn from them, I think, about some of the new technologies and other changes that are going on, and they could also learn from me about, I think, some of the more traditional values and principles and ethics and, and practices of, of journalism. So it just seemed like a really good fit. Robert's primary responsibility is the business side, making sure there's enough revenue to support a daily newspaper. Though he offers advice when asked, he says it's the students who are calling the shots. So they make all of the news decisions about what to cover, when to cover, how to cover it. Um, the decisions are all theirs, and I think that's one of the really great things about the Daily Nexus, is that it is a student paper for students and by students. The decision makers are here in the Daily Nexus newsroom. The university editor, the county editor, the layout editor, the managing editor, and the editor-in-chief. These and a dozen other staffers do a remarkable job reporting the news of interest to the campus community five days a week, many while taking a full load of classes. It's a very hectic lifestyle. Um, there's always something happening. There's never a dull moment. We're always running around trying to change the layout because something new has happened and you know this story needs more space or we got to go get a picture. Or, oh my goodness, this just happened. You know, it's not boring. It's not your nine to five. You can you know you've been here until all hours of the morning and. It's just a really great life. Oh yeah, I spend about 40 hours a week in here, probably a little bit more. Um, and every day we meet at 5 o'clock, uh, Sunday through Thursday. Um, and we put together the news stories for the next day. All right, uh, County, what do you got? We got uh, tickets by West. A big story on this day was the visit of rapper Chuck D, here to support the pledge drive of KCSB. His original name is Carlton Douglas Ridenhauer. Chuck D. made the front page of the next day's paper, along with a county story on local elections. I love this job. It's ridiculous. I, I try to treat it as kind of my own personal fiefdom. You know, it's fun, like, you know, having staff writers and people you can uh, it is tell what to, to do. That's, that's great, yeah. isn't it? I know. Yeah. But aside from that, it just, it makes you, it gives you this feeling of satisfaction when you edit a story and you take something that, you know, was maybe kind of mediocre and you make it something really cool and interesting to read, so. Yeah, and the newspaper is a cool thing too because then the next day you can go and open it and yeah. you're like, oh, I did that or I wrote that or I edited that. Dana Olson also does this, a weekly sex column called The Wednesday Hump, a feature we're told is among the most frequently read in the Nexus. And it's the best outlet on campus to be able to write and be able to do stuff like that. So you come, if, when you work for the Nexus, you come and you go through a training session that's just two days long, um, and you kind of learn the basics of journalism and being a, a reporter, but then most of it is just on the job training. We have so little time outside the, outside the paper, what was classes, that you, the Nexus is your family, it's your life. I don't have very many friends outside the Nexus because I spend so much time here. And the thing is, if you have friends outside the Nexus and they want you to spend so much time with them, they don't understand how much time you have to devote to the Nexus, and they don't understand why you have to go back in at 3 o'clock in the morning to go fix something that might be wrong. They don't understand why that that's important enough for you to you know, lose an hour of your sleep over. 
whereas everyone that works here totally understands that, and it's just second nature to them. Oh, of course you go back in to fix it. That commitment to excellence pleases Jerry Roberts. As a former editor of the San Francisco Chronicle and then executive editor of the Santa Barbara News Press, he has made a career of upholding the values and ethics of good journalism. And he's paid a price for that. In 2006, he quit the news press in protest over what he said was the owner's undue influence on news content, a feat that earned him the prestigious Penn Award for the First Amendment, but also made him a target of a multi-million dollar legal action over his contract. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fighting litigation filed by a billionaire newspaper owner that threatens to financially ruin my family, I have quite naturally spent a lot of time in the past year reflecting on the choices I faced and made in, in leaving the paper. And I can tell you that it's not an easy thing for people with kids or mortgages or medical problems to go home and tell your family you've left your job for an issue of principle. Staying true to his beliefs has been an inspiration to the Nexus staff. This is a guy who's He's getting sued for $25 million, and you know he's gone through a lot of things, and you never see him stressed out. He's always calm, collected, and he still has a sense of humor. You know, I think that's something to look up to. Setting a good example is important to Roberts. In terms of what you're going to do, do it because you, you care about it. You know, it's, it's, you can make a lot of money doing a lot of different things, but if you're not passionate about the work that you're doing, if you don't care about it, if you don't look forward to, to doing it, if you're not excited by it, if you don't have a good time doing it, if it's not fun, um, you ought to probably look for something else. Finding what you love and doing it with heart, a lesson not lost on these young scribes. One story these future professional journalists will surely cover is climate change. And tonight, we'll show you what the University of California is doing now to respond to its challenges. We'll go to Berkeley in a moment, but first, Paul Fotenhauer on sustainability at UC Davis. Juice, power, energy. By any name, it's what makes UC Davis come alive every day. And every day, students, staff, and faculty are learning how this campus can reduce its contribution to global warming. Efficient energy use is essential to the mission of UC Davis, a campus committed to the stewardship of the environment. From my perspective as a chancellor, we have to begin now. Uh, it's not like we haven't been doing anything, but we have to go into a higher uh, gear. In fact, the UC president has set system-wide sustainable goals to minimize the entire system's impact on the environment. Among those goals are developing an action plan for achieving what's called climate neutrality as soon as possible while maintaining the overall mission of the university. That would mean working toward the university having a net zero impact on the Earth's climate. Each campus will strive to increase the percentage of low or zero emission vehicles by 50 percent by the year 2010. In addition, each campus is hoping to achieve zero waste by 2020, meaning everything will be recycled, giving relief to our own landfill. At UC Davis, our 5,300 acres makes us the largest campus in the system. We are home to nearly 1,200 buildings, 760 cars and trucks, and 52 buses. That makes the carbon footprint of this campus significant. Amy Fole of the campus's Environmental Health and Safety Unit converted the campus's energy consumption in 2005 to carbon dioxide emissions and found that this campus produced 228,893 metric tons of gas in 2005. That's the same amount of CO2 gas produced by driving 54,000 cars for a year. The biggest contributor to our carbon footprint is the natural gas usage and electricity consumption. The energy bill for campus is about $25 million per year, which about $15 million is for electricity and about $10 million for natural gas. If you include all of our auxiliaries that pay for their own services, uh, we're up about $45 million for the total campus utilities program. Just by updating mechanical systems, the campus will save one and a half million dollars a year in energy costs and reduce the carbon footprint by four percent. New campus facilities are designed with five principles. They are sustainable sites, energy efficiency, water conservation, 
wise use of building materials, and indoor air quality. The Gladys Valley Hall included those elements, and as a result, it is the most energy efficient building on campus. It uses 35% less energy than other buildings its size. As part of our sustainable sites measures on this project, we used a native meadow grass to both reduce the water uh, needed for irrigation as well as create a natural look here. And that does involve a change in aesthetics. Instead of people seeing a clip lawn in some of the buildings around campus, you actually see more of a natural meadow effect. Also, the uh, rainwater that collects on the roof runs down through these pipes into this rock line channel and that actually seeps into the ground and recharges the groundwater instead of overflowing and going directly into the stormwater system. The UC Davis R4 recycling program just received a statewide award for best practices for the work on effectively reducing waste on this campus. Lynn King, the project manager, says in order for the campus to meet the zero waste goal by 2020, it means more than just recycling. There are a lot of industry vendors out there that we're working with to generate zero waste. So it's not just going to be what we can recycle, it's going to be what we buy. So that will be the strategic sourcing project, the environmental preference purchasing. That is also a huge key for this whole process to work. 55% of the campus is purchasing recycled copy paper and the goal is to get that to 100% as soon as possible. 1,000 acres of this campus is intensively landscaped and maintained. That includes 9,000 trees, hundreds of acres of grass, and a two-mile-long arboretum. 100% of the green waste goes back to the landscape in the form of fertilizer, mulch, and ground cover. In the summer months, the campus uses more than a million gallons of water a day for irrigation. We're excited about the fact that we've got a new central system that makes watering so much more efficient. A $1 million computer now controls all the systems by monitoring the water content of plants. The campus will save 700,000 gallons of water a week. That's enough to fill 25 to 35 swimming pools every day. All fertilizers used on campus are now 100% organic. And for every tree that dies on campus, two are planted. Trees capture thousands of pounds of carbon dioxide every year and replace it with oxygen. The key to sustainability is not just living the green life. Rather, it's about continuing research and teaching the next generation. In the classroom, design students are learning a concept called cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles. That means that designing so that there is no waste in the future. That's really our ultimate goal, not to recycle, but to produce no waste. UC Sustainability Chief believes that the goals set by the university are achievable. I have to be optimistic that we can achieve them because society depends upon it. Uh, we have to come up with solutions as a society and the university is the uh, innovator or one of the innovators for society to come up with new ideas. We have all this brain power on our campuses so if we can't do it on our campuses where else can we do it? The transformation to a sustainable society will be challenging, but we need to remember that this is an investment, not an expense. After all, we live in critical times. Paul Fotenauer reporting in Davis. And now, Roxanne McCostian on Going Green at UC Berkeley. The public's attention these days is focused intently on the problem of global warming and the damage we're doing to the Earth. And UC Berkeley is getting attention of its own for going green in a big way fast. One of the biggest new developments on campus is the announcement of the Energy Biosciences Institute, a major research effort combining the expertise and investments of UC Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the BP Oil Company. This is great news for California and this is great news for America because it is the world's first research lab dedicated to long-term productions of alternative fuels and it's right here in California. With Berkeley's proximity to the technology sector and its track record for innovation, the administration has made its energy and sustainability efforts a top priority. Suddenly a lot of people are paying attention and we have now new avenues uh, a possible support for the research we must do, and these include private philanthropy, foundations, state government, federal government, and energy companies like BP. And so we 
now have a lot of very exciting possibilities, and we're pushing on all of these fronts simultaneously. To help us move away from using fossil fuels for transportation, EBI will invent technology to improve biofuels, fuels made from plants instead of oil. Nobel laureate Steve Chu, who directs the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory next to UC Berkeley, began an effort several years ago to accelerate the pace of developing more efficient forms of alternative energy. I became convinced that the climate change projections were inc increasingly ominous. We had to do something about it. I looked around and I realized that Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in partnership with the University of California, Berkeley, had the intellectual capacity to be a world center for the type of energy research that would lead to solutions. One of the things we're trying to accomplish with the EBI is to create a group of scientists and, and social scientists uh, that see all aspects of the problem. Chris Somerville is the new director of the Energy Biosciences Institute. He says that inventing technology that can use plants and their unique ability to transform sunlight to energy will have far-reaching effects for society. The energy in sunlight that strikes the surface of the Earth is about 10,000 times more energy than all the energy used by humans. So if we could capture just 1% of that, which is what a, a highly productive plant crop can do, uh, we would only need 5% of the terrestrial surface to meet all human energy needs. This is the site for the new facility that will house the Energy Biosciences Institute. It's in the Berkeley Hills, right on the boundary between the UC Berkeley campus and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. The construction will be funded with part of the $500 million BP grant, which will be spread over the next 10 years. This is going to infuse a lot of interest and in energy and people and channel people uh, towards biofuels and biological solutions to the energy problem. Carolyn Bertozzi directs LBNL's Molecular Foundry next door to the future EBI building. The foundry's expertise in nanotechnology, that is technology that works on the scale of tiny molecules, will be useful for EBI's biofuel scientists. They can take advantage of our instruments, our materials, our scientists, our knowledge and our capabilities, and they can also bring new interesting problems to the table and will mobilize to work towards solving these problems. The Energy Secretary has proposed the goal of getting 30 percent of all transportation fuels in the U.S. from biomass by 2030, but I actually think uh, we'll meet that goal far before 2030. Always look at your cultures, look at the kind of patterns that you're getting. Beyond the dozens of Berkeley projects devoted to energy research, the university recently took a serious look at the amount of greenhouse gases that the campus emits. The chancellor made a commitment to cut those emissions down to 1990 levels within seven years. And students have been very involved in these efforts. It was student input that got Berkeley's dining service to put into place the first certified organic salad bar at a university. I think that there's an awareness in Berkeley in general and in the, in the country as a whole of uh, moving towards sustainable agriculture, wanting to know where your food comes from, feeling comfortable about the farming practices and what we're doing to the earth, um, global warming, all those issues are important to people and I think that this ties in with that. I think in general our society promotes chemicals and artificiality more than it should and it's, it's nice to get back to that kind of more wholesome type foods. Berkeley's essentially leading the way and saying this it really is possible, this isn't just a dream, this is something that some motivated people can make happen at their institution. In so many ways, the campus is getting greener by the day, and the intention of many campus officials, faculty, and students is that the green coming out of Berkeley will rub off on the rest of the world. I'm Roxanne Makashjan at UC Berkeley. I'm now in the archives section of the Daily Nexus newspaper, and who could have guessed when the first edition was published in the 1960s that someday UC researchers would make news by studying the genetics of dogs to understand humans? That's exactly what's happening at UC San Francisco. Larissa Brannan explains. The entire dog genome, a detailed map of dog genes, was sequenced in 2005. With this wealth of information available, researchers at the University of California, San Francisco and the University of Pennsylvania launched the Canine Behavioral Genetics Project in an effort to identify and better understand the genetics behind panic and anxiety disorders and aggression. 
Dr. Steve Hamilton, a human geneticist and psychiatrist at UC San Francisco, is co-leader of the project. It's basically a collaboration between geneticists and uh, animal behaviorists trying to get at the genetic basis for complex behaviors. In the short term, what we would like to do is determine if there are genetic influences on dog behavior, like something like noise phobia. Is there a, a, uh, an influence from, from the dog's genes? Behavioral disorders are one of the main reasons dog owners give up their pets. Many end up abandoned, in shelters, or are euthanized. You wanna go under? Under. Under. There you go, good boy. Melanie Chang's goal is to help owners keep their dogs. A lot of times people are very determined, but they don't really know what to do. And if they don't understand the mechanism behind the problem that their dog is experiencing, then they can't effectively deal with it. And so I've known many people who, despite their best efforts and all of the help that they could receive at the time, were not able to make their relationship with their dog successful and keep the dog in the home because the problems were too complicated or beyond their means to treat. And so once we understand exactly what's happening with all of these dogs, then we'll be able to more effectively keep the dogs in the homes. And that's really what I would like to see out of this. In the long run, understanding behavioral disorders in dogs may also shed light on similar behavioral problems in humans. As a psychiatrist, I'm primarily interested in behaviors related to human psychopathology, and that means something like anxiety or aggression. Uh, and so we're focusing on collecting dogs and dog families in which these problems occur, and then trying to use the genetic tools that are available to understand are there areas of the dog genome that may tell us something about these disorders in dogs. And ultimately, they may also illuminate our understanding of these disorders in humans. Hamilton says this study really underscores that dog is human's best friend. The dog has done so much for humans over the last 10,000 years uh, in terms of companionship, nice. uh, working with us in the field, et cetera. And it's only fitting that now the, the dog has come to help us in terms of understanding the, the basic mechanisms of, of disease, uh, potentially leading to uh, novel treatments and cures and diagnostics for human disease. And I hope that what we can do is also offer something back to the dog in terms of, of, of helping dogs and dog owners um, come to grips with the diseases that they suffer from. In San Francisco, I'm Larissa Brannan. And finally tonight, your car and the road communicating with one another to make your drive a little easier, a little faster, and a lot more safe. Here's Jim Sissel. The VII California program is a successful and unprecedented initiative for vehicle infrastructure integration. The project brings together public, private, and academic partners under the leadership of Caltrans and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, or MTC. VII, or Vehicle Infrastructure Integration, is the car or truck talking and listening to the road, and the road likewise talking and listening to the car. It's an unprecedented integration, literally and figuratively, of the road to the vehicle. Prior to this, the road and vehicle integration has always been the rubber tire. This way, we use wireless means and a dedicated, high-speed, very reliable wireless means to talk and listen to one another to give an integrated transportation system. The ITS Joint Program Office of the U.S. DOT has recognized the leadership, innovation, and significance of the project by officially including it into the federal VII effort. The VII California testbed, which is located on the San Francisco Bay Peninsula, has been in operation for nearly two years and is the nation's first realization of VII. Auto industry partners have joined with Caltrans and the MTC to develop applications that use the testbed. Traffic management, on-ramp metering, the applications abound because you have this unprecedented information source from the vehicle and you have this unprecedented way of getting information quickly and reliably into the vehicle. Support for the infrastructure development is provided by ITS researchers at the University of California PATH program and by Telvent Faradine, which operates and maintains the San Francisco Bay Area's 511 system. The VII California testbed now has 12 roadside equipment installations at freeway and arterial sites, 
with 28 more installations planned for the next year. Essential to VII is the vehicle to roadside communication provided by DSRC radios. DSRC, or Dedicated Short Range Communication, transmits on the 5.9 gigahertz band, which is reserved by the FCC for safety and informational applications on vehicles and roadside equipment. Time critical and location critical messages, such as this incident message, can be delivered to the drivers as they approach the affected area. In this demonstration, signal phase and timing information is received, then displayed in the vehicle. The end vehicle display changes synchronously with the signal head that faces the driver. By combining the DSRC broadcast with end vehicle sensor systems, the user interface can warn the driver about a potential signal violation. DSRC can also send data from one vehicle to another vehicle. In this demonstration, vehicles send emergency braking messages. The end vehicle display integrates these vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety messages with the infrastructure safety messages. Warning, red light, warning, red light. I personally have a safety vision. That is the ability for intersections to talk to cars, for the ability of drivers to understand when that light is going to transition, the ability of the car to tell you that you're going too fast for the conditions on that roadway means safety of life and means everything to my job. In the end, VII California aims to combine the resources, expertise, and innovations of the public sector, the auto industry, aftermarket suppliers, and other private sector participants for the benefit of the traveling public. This is Jim Sissel at UC Berkeley. That's our program for tonight. I'd like to thank the journalists at the Daily Nexus who welcomed us into their newsroom and to you for joining us on State of Minds. Signing off from UC Santa Barbara, I'm Shannon Bradley. Good night.